Um, I'm uh, Dale Hendricks from uh, GemTalk Systems, and I'm going to talk about Toad today. And the title of the talk is "And Now for Something Completely Different." If I had more time to prepare, I would have taken my pants off for this. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> if you're I, Monty Python, right? Okay. Um, all right. So Toad. All right. If you haven't heard of it, Toad before. Toad stands for the object-centric development environment. All right. And um, it originally started out as work to do a development environment for doing remote small talk development um, over the WAN and uh, for, for Gemstone S. All right? And there's interesting problems when you're trying to do things over the WAN. But, um, but basically, it's, like I said, it started as a seaside app running in a web browser. And then I think a couple years ago, I came here and gave a talk, um, the, the Cumus, Cumus um, where I used Amber. To, on the, as the client and uh, Gemstone S uh, and again a Seaside app, um, but there were there were technical di technical difficulties in getting that to do all of the things I wanted to do. This is a development environment, okay? This isn't client server. You know, I'm doing uh, you know web browser for you know some application and there's a clean clean separation. You've got a development environment, and I'm interested in giving development environment style things to and give developers hands-on to the, the code that they're working with, which means that um, are you going to learn JavaScript to do things in Toad, or are you going to learn you know, HTML to do things, or learn Seaside? So, so those are interesting. That, that's an interesting pro problem set for a remote development environment. The other interesting problem set is when you're doing inspecting and looking at a bunch of different objects, um, you don't know ahead of time what the model is that you're going to be looking at. So you have to have some generic uh, approaches to doing things. So. Um, so anyway, the goals that I had um, for, for Toad are the, the remote small talk development over the WAN for Gemstone. Um, when you're doing your own development environment, you have an opportunity to go in and fix things that you think are broken. And I think there are some problems with the, the current crop of small talk development environments that um, I attempted to address here. So you know, I'll talk, I'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit more. And the other thing is, is emphasis on objects, all right? Toad, object-centric, all right? Um, I think the, the current small talk development environments tend to isolate you and insulate you from your objects. You've got the inspector, but that's about the only place where you actually can dive in and touch your object, all right? And touch your objects in many different ways is really what, we want, what you want to be able to do. The other part of this for me is, is tool development, all right? For the most part, you know, do you really want to go off and, and uh, you know, build a code browser just so that you can do something specific for your particular application? So the, I think the entry point for doing tools is too high with the current development environment. You're on your own, basically. If you know Morphic, okay, go off and be crazy, all right? But if you don't know Morphic, um, and also the other thing is, is with the, um, um, the monolithic tools, like, for example, I want to do senders, all right? Where do I go to find that in the image? I want to do senders just like it does in the code browser. How do I get that code? How do I use that in my tool that I'm building that's not a code browser? You know, there is no answer to that. So this is, this is the area that I'm really trying to address with, with Toad. And these, are, and these are the goals that I set out to, uh, um, to, to address. So this is a picture of the Toad development environment in all of its glory. <laughs> um, this is, doesn't look like a regular small talk development environment. Each one of those panes up there is a window, an independent window. And that, that architectural decision was kind of one that I did, that I used because of the remote development environment. Um, in a monolithic tool, you tend to have events that fly around inside that tool, uncontrolled events. And if you've got the, the wire involved all right, in uncontrolled events, you have no control over what your latency is going to be for updates and everything else. So what I did here is I said, you know, I've got one window. It connects and talks to the server, and I'm off to the races. All right? And so that's, that, that kind of drove me down this path. But then there's some interesting things that you can do when you, when you break the wind, when you basically deconstruct the system browser. And there is a system browser up here. All right? Might have to stand on Does somebody have a laser pointer? Because I don't know, if you squint, you can see the, the system browser. Right up here is the uh, object TD definition. There's your class list, all right? Definition, class definition in the middle pane at the top. On the, on the right, you've got instance methods and class methods, all right? Visible at the same time. You don't have to click on a, on a button to toggle back and forth between, um, between your instance and, and class methods. I'll probably 
blind myself. Okay, I'll point it at somebody else. Um, so you don't have to, you can see both the class and instance side at the same time. Um, and then uh, over here is the method, method pane. Now these are panes, and to a large extent, they, they work a lot like, you know, I took inspiration from Emacs in doing this. You know, when you're using Emacs, if you've used Emacs, you have multiple panes, and you, they're laid out in fixed positions on the screen, and what you do is you put different things into those panes and look at things, all right? And it really cuts down on window clutter, which is one of my pet peeves with the small talk development environments is when you start popping up system browsers that you can't find anything. All right, it's lost all over the place. So this is a nice orderly, you know, controlled mechanism for saying, I know where to look for my method, method pane. It's right here in the middle, all right? Instance methods, all right, that's over here. Class methods, over here. You don't have to go search. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to have a demo here, so I'll actually show you how these things work in, in practice. But, um, so, so the trick, what I want to do now is talk a little bit about the architecture that I've used for the client-server communication. And it's what I call, the, uh, I call an ultra-thin client. All right, um, all of the application logic lives and executes on the server. So if you're doing development of anything, everything is running on the server. All right, there is code that runs on the client, but it is you don't have to touch that code when you're writing tools. All right, don't have to get there at all. Um, and so what that does for you is it gives you predictable network round trips with this. Because again, you're only going across the wire at known, known times. There's no model that's running on the client that needs to go grab some information from the server that then comes back to the client that then says, oh, we gotta go back to the server. So that, that can cause problems for, for round trips. And so what this looks like in practice is in Gemstone, if you can see this, I have a list and array of TD class definitions. And that's, that's the model in Gemstone. Over the wire, I ship the names of the class definitions that then populate the definition list on the client. So this can be anything because I pass a list of strings across the wire. And you know these guys, what do they do? They display, they, they display lists of strings, all right? Um, when you click, on an object in this window. I send the index across the wire, all right? And things run on the server, all right? In this particular case, um, when you get the item selected, we look up the, uh, we get the, uh, this is actually the lookup in the item cache. And this is details that you don't have to work with as this is, this is, this is mechanism. But basically I get the object and then I send the item selected method to in this case, in the previous case, TD class definition. What happens when I select it? Well, the model tells us. Um, and obviously, you know, the idea is you can change this. You can change this logic. Um, all right. Um, the small talk development environment deficiencies. Um, for me, you know, the biggest problem I have with small talk is writing scripts. Right now, you have workspaces and classes, okay? And you have tools that are hide all of the model lot, all, all of the interesting things, all right? I like to say that like in the MC browser, each one of the menu items or each one of the lists has five lines of code that's interesting. But there's probably 25 or 30 methods that you have to wade through and read, you know, the equivalent amount of code to figure out what those five lines are. So, you know, if I wanted to write a script that used Monticello browser f functionality, I'd end up being copying and pasting if I can find that code, all right? That's no way. We're small talkers. We copy and paste, and, and of course, workspaces are, you know, an abomination by themselves. Um, I mentioned window clutter earlier, um, and then, and, and I've also mentioned, I've, I'm beating this drum. Monolithic tools hide the, the, the objects. Um, so one of the one of the piece one of the features of Toad is a, uh, a scripting uh, scripting interface. All right, and I've taken inspiration from the Bash shell. All right. And I use a bash style command processor, command name, you know, strings on the command line. And I'm not trying to send messages here, all right? This is pure shell, all right? Um, and I have a shell console window, and you type things into the shell console window. Uh, the shell console, if you imagine that you have your system menu, but what you had is everything you could possibly do in your development environment in the system menu, Imagine how big the system menu would get, how deeply nested it would get to all of the hundreds, maybe thousands of functions that you actually want to call as a top-level thing. 
in the regular small talk environment, you navigate to the window that you need to find and navigate to the spot and the thing, and then you find the window, then you go down the hierarchy. That's what I want to do, all right? Oh, and I, did I mention scripting? How do you script that? So, um, you know, so I have a shell console window. Um, it's small talk. So I, imagine if, what is it, uh, if Alan Kay and, oh, who was it? Um, who was it that invented the shell? Got together in 1978 or so and said, let's use objects instead of files in a shell. So that's kind of the, the mechanism that I've used in trying to build this thing. So everything is an object in this shell. This is not standard in, standard out. It's not characters in, characters out. It's object in, object out. Um, and it works on objects, returns objects as a result. Um, and then Smalltalk is the scripting language for, the, for, for this program. So in Bash, you have a, the, your, your shell which you write shell scripts. And then when you actually write a shell script, and you can do this in the shell as well, you end up using bash with this weird control structures and everything else. So there's a break for, for Toad. The shell is um, what looks like a regular bash shell syntax for typing in commands. But when you actually define a command, use small talk. All right? So, well, let's take a look at what I'm talking about here. So I'll give you a demo on, on the command shell. Switch glasses. <laughs> okay, now let's see. I've got to go escape. Um, Turn on mirroring. Go to my connect. Mm -hmm. Nope. Wrong way. Oops. Change. It changed then, yeah. This is what I get for not having practiced this part before the demo. So what I have to do is, oh, crap, okay. All right. Sorry about that, guys. Let's see. Yes. Keyboard displays. There we go. Okay, and I want to turn. I, I, have I got it? So I'm going to turn off monitoring. Oh. I'm going to run out of power here. Yep. <laughs> All right, so. Huh? Yeah, I think I think so. Mm. Type my command. Oops. Okay, so what I've just done is um, I've logged in to a gemstone instance that's running on my laptop. All right, so this is Ferro 2.0. And it's it's um it's kind of magic right now and unimportant to know what how I do it. But basically, as soon as I type in a command, I log in. All right, and I did an ls. Yes. Um, now if you want to get take about five minutes. Because this is all you know laid out. I have a workspace that I can do this in. I had I had asked earlier if people could see in it, and you weren't you, you weren't there to to vote. <laughs> All right, so um, so ls, this looks like a shell. Oh, I got things that look like um, commands or um, directories here, so let's just do an ls external. You know, so I got things. I can cd into external, you know, cd dot dot. So, you know, that looks like a shell. Um, and I've got this, this guy here, um, hello, all right? And he's got a star behind it, all right? So the star means executable, all right? And let's just edit hello. And what we've got is a small talk block. And what you've got coming in here is Topez, which is my, you know, my, my, main, my, main, my main guy that knows everything that's going on, the object in for the command, the tokens that were typed in on the command line, and a window ID. Um, and, uh, and it's a block. So, and then I've got Smalltalk code. So this is my this is my shell. I can sit, or my uh, my workspace. So I can type dot slash hello, and it, ret it returns hello world. Now, if you look in here, you'll see if my token size is greater than one, then I I define world as whatever I've typed in. So I can type in here. Um, You know, so now what, what this what, what does this mean? This means that if you've got work script uh, workspaces where you constantly go in and say, oh, I got to edit this thing and I'm going to edit this thing and set this and then select this big thing and say do it, you don't have to do that anymore. You type something on the command line, you pass in the arguments to your script, it executes the script, and yet, you know pressing the up arrow key 
you know, run it over and over again, all right? Dot, 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 you know. So, so the thing is, is this now all of a sudden, you know, this by itself, I think, is worth, you know, using everywhere, you know, because, you know, this is something we don't do. We don't have this, and it's not possible to do. So uh, let's see. Um, so we, we ran our hello command, all right? And you notice I got this thing that's a string. Well, I'm going to type inspect, all right? Inspect opens up um, a navigator on uh, object in, all right? And what you see over here on the right is an inspector on the string object. Um, you see the characters. I can click on this. I'm not inside the character. Do I want to get, no, I don't want to get there yet. So I'm seeing what the class is, what the oop is. In gemstone, oop is an integer. This is the object ID. And ASCII value, et cetera. These are all, you know. So this is stuff that you can, I can navigate it around in that object, all right, look at, and look at the whole state of the object. Now, now strings are special things, so I'm going to do a command P. Actually, I'm going to use, I got menus. If anybody saw the <laughs> previous demos, there weren't menus. This is brand new. The paint's not dry on these guys. But I can sit down and say object print. And I can now get a, a window on my on my the print string for my object. So if you've ever been in you know an inspector and had things you know truncated at 120 characters and wished oh, I want to see what the real print string is, they, well this is that's what this is this is designed for for doing that. Um, let's see. Oh, um, so I talked about standard out. All right. So if I say dot slash hello and then right arrow into ants. All right. So I've got my string. If I cat ants, all right, it's the string. So I've created an object in my structure here. And this guy's an object. Now, so he's brown, all right, and he's got the at sign. And that means he's an object that you can, and the at sign means it's an object that you can kind of navigate to. So I can CD into ants and do an LS. And I see the instance variables. Now, so that's not very interesting to look at instance variables for, for things. So I've got a, I created a command called DS, which is display instead of list. And what it does is basically give you what the inspector view would look like. And oh, by the way, inspect dot brings up an inspector. If I close this, that wasn't very obvious. If I do inspect dot, I open, I bring up an inspector on the directory that I'm in, which happens to be an object, which is now what we're looking at. So, you know, this is objects everywhere, all right, and easy access to these guys. Um, LSDS. Um, okay. So, so the final thing I want to show is man ls. <laughs> Oops. All right. So you can document your commands. All right. And standard process, standard things are there. There's a way to, there's a mechanism for setting these things up. So, okay. We'll go back to our thing, and I'm not going to. Okay. All right. We'll just, we'll just wing it this way. All right. Oops. Yeah. All right. So um, I think I talked a little bit about this one um, in that these are tiled windows, and I've got a tiled window layout. Obviously, that's what's going on up there. And the way this works is I have named window locations, and I have named windows. So I guess I didn't show that here, but I'll show it the next time. I've got another demo coming up. That, that um, the windows are being reused. Um, and so you don't end up getting a big stack, but you can control whether you want a big stack of windows or not. We'll, we'll look at that and, then, and see how uh, the demo's just a minute away. So anyway, what, I, what here is the named window locations. So when you're you know, creating a command and you say, let's put it in the methods location, then that's where it goes. All right? So now you know where, where things lay out, out you know, wh what positions on the screen and what they're called, and can target moving windows into certain positions with this because you know in Emacs you had you know browser or uh, buffer 1 buffer 2 buffer 3 buffer 4 laid out on the screen i don't know maybe you can go to 8 now i'm not sure um, so but this is small talk this is objects I, we don't have to go with a rectangle and we don't have to call them 1 and 2 we can have real names and we can have overlapping and there's actually i've got more than this in the current system that are overlapping windows all right so back to the demo um, what I want to show you now is I want to go into the code browser because we saw the shell. I want to show you the Monticello browser a la Toad. Um, I want to show you project structure, so those directories. It's like, well, what do you do with directories? And I've played a lot of games. I want to show you what goes on with the, with the, with the, uh, with the project structure. I want to build a tool, all right, the kind of tool that, you know, that I'm targeting. And, uh, and I think you know, that, you know, I'm happy about it. And also Git integration, all right? So I've added commands that support Git. So we'll get back to this. And 
All right. So let's start with, so we're, we're talking, talking about the code browser now. So let's do man browse, and browse is the, oops, the primary command for interface to this. So here are all the different things that you can browse. You can browse a method, which a method spec, let's look at the documentation, I think I say what it is. It's basically object, right arrow, right arrow, et cetera, for, for doing that. So there's a way to look at that. You can browse a category, a class category. You can browse a class. You can browse diff two methods. Um, you can browse the hierarchy of a given class. Um, arbitrary list, the object, uh, using an object specification. So if you dropped an out, a list down on your disk somewhere, you can go browse that. Browse a method, just naming the selector, so that's all, all implementers. Uh, browse a package, a project, um, da, 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 references. Uh, this is uh, a method with using a reg regular expression, um, so you can match a, a regular expression pattern. Senders do the same thing, sender source, symbolist, and method versions. So, you know, so this is a menu, monster menu in and of itself, all right, that every object should have. And so, you know, and, and it doesn't. So this is a shortcut for getting there. Let's see. So what we'll do is we'll browse um, uh, method at put. Okay, so over here, I've got the implementers of at put. And I'm going to close the this guy and that guy. And click on, you know, canonical symbol dictionary. So i got the method that shows up here. And I'm going to just move this to show that I'm actually reusing that window. So, um, and over here is the category of the class of the method. All right. So that's just useful information. And but these are all separate windows that are kind of coordinated together. Um, let's see. Ah, yes. All right, so if I sit down and look at this dictionary and use the menu, um, the object menu, browse code. So these guys down here tend to be on all of the windows that I've got. So they're like the generic stuff. So you can do an edit. So cut, copy, paste is how you delete methods. Uh, move methods from one class to another, um, one category to another. Delete classes. Um, move classes from, uh, from one package to another. Or, uh, yeah, yeah. And... Uh, and then an object method that does a browse code, which I'll show you. And this now brings up the, what the class browser. And I've got a hierarchy list of the classes for HTTP form dictionary, the class definition, as we saw before, instance, and there are no, no class methods. And when I click on this, I'm reusing my method window. All right? Now, what if I want to look at two different methods? All right? Well, to start with, OK, I haven't put menus on the text guy yet. <laughs> But the keyboard shortcuts are working, and they're the same as the keyboard shortcut for um, window, clone window. So, so if, I, whoops, if I clone this window, you'll just see what happens. I just create a new copy. All right? And when I click on it, they're both now targeted to the same window. In fact, all of the method guys are aiming at the same window. Um, but if I take this guy, and I'll show you what the sh keyboard shortcut was, clone window, command shift C. So I'll come over here and Command Shift C, and now I can look at my two methods side by side if I want to. All right. And what's what's really useful is to Command Shift C the instance methods for a class, and I can poke around and look at the methods for one class while I'm. Oops. Yes. Yeah, that works that way. Um, but I can look at I can I can poke around on these guys because you know you start writing code in one window and you want to look at oh how did that work or what's the example and so anyway that that's the mechanism for doing this and so the yes I can do 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 Command Shift C to everybody and the same kinds of rules apply that I click on a dictionary I get the hierarchy I get the class and and move things around so if I'm sitting over in this window and I've lost my context all right Command Shift B will bring me back to the context of that window. So I can hop back and forth between two classes if I want to look at that stuff. So it depends on what you want to look at. And that's, that's one of the problems with, with menus is its workflow, all right? And you know, can you have a menu for every workflow? And that gets to be difficult. So you know, the, the combination here is, is aimed at trying to support a, you know, you know, different kinds of workflows. Um, let's see. So the last thing I want to show is just because I, you know, I think it's cool. Um, Oh, I got five minutes. Okay, um, browse, but but 
it's not fair that I had to pay. So, um, let's see. So at colon backslash oops backslash um, where did I get this browse at backslash okay yeah. So I'm going to browse all methods that match the pattern at colon, okay? And so here's, here's all these guys. So that's a fairly useful thing when you remember, don't quite remember what the name of the selector is and can go in and, and spelunk around. So now I'll jump in and show you the uh, Monticello browser. Um, so we'll start with the, the commands. And so I can do a Monticello um, adopt or Monticello adopt ancestors browse bump commit compare multiple flavors of compare copy. So all of the commands that are available from the Monticello browser are available by typing at the, the shell or writing a script to access these things. Um, so now you can build your own deployment scripts without having to de um, decompile Monticello browser to figure out how to do that. Um, Let's see. We've done. Okay. So and and uh, but I have a browser. There's a real browser behind this as well. So let's look at uh, MC list external. All right. And what that does is, um, yeah, it gives me the list of working copies in the image. All right. So that window popped up, and there that matched the pattern. So I've got baseline of external and external core here. And if you're, you know, so this is a, uh, you know, reduce the list of working copies in the Monticello browser. Um, if I click on external core, I get the repository over here that it's in. So this is, so now this is, okay, this is the Monticello browser. It's just in two separate panes that are independent. Now if I click on a, on a repository, oh, and then I, I say packages, all right? Now I've done an open on the repository, and I have the list of packages over here in this window. And, you know, external tests, I go back over here and I get the list of versions. Now, this happens to be a file tree repository, so I only have one version in there. But I can click on this guy. I can see what his summary information is up here in this window. And I can look at um, history for, for that guy. All right. And so all of the functionality is there. But the interesting piece here is if you wanted to look at, if you wanted to open a repository for a particular package, you go to Package Browser, Repository, open now to get there. So um, what I've done is in, uh, let's, let's CD back, CD into external. So in my external project directory, I have a thing called repo. The at sign, this means it's an object. Well, let me cat it first. And it's a small talk expression, all right, slightly different than the brown one, um, that returns a repository. Okay, so I can sit down and say uh, MR packages at repo, and I get the list of packages for that repository. So, you know, you noticed I CD'd into external. External is my project directory, and I have things in there that relate to my external project. Um, I'm going to uh, jump ahead and show you some of the things. Um, so, I have a browse command. Guess what that does? That lets me browse the classes that I think are interesting in the external project. Let's cat the browse command. Um, these uh, guys that are this kind of bluish color here with the execute behind them, this is where you actually type shell commands into a separate window. But it's very dumb. You know, if you want to do something fancy, you go straight to, to, the, uh, to the object uh, version. Um, but it's, it's, it's doing a browse, browse project external, which is the, the obvious thing, but you can customize this inside this guy. Um, cat commit. Um, commit does a bin home commit, a package name, and a commit message. All right, well, let's cat the commit message just to see that. Oops. I'm going to get command completion. I don't have it yet. So, all right, so... You know, I've got you know some some random commit message there. But if I now edit um, slash home bin slash commit, and I'm going to open this up big. Um, you know the meaning. Five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. Okay. Yeah. what I've done is um, so this does a commit, and I'm grabbing the Monticello tool. Of getting a tool instance for the mm command. So this is how 
the mechanism works when you're writing shell scripts. I've got an MC command. If I wanted to call from Smalltalk an MC command, I would do tool instance for MC, and I would get whatever tool implements the MC. The implication here is you can install your own version of the MC command if you want to override, and all the scripts that are written to use the MC command do a lookup via the name of the command. So you end up using the one that you would get if you typed at the command line. And all of the tools are written stylistically to give an API for all of your all of the commands. So you so that you make them so you design it. You build your tools to be called called from the command line or called from a Smalltalk API written in a script. So and then I've got my commit message and I go ooh you know and I, you know this is some some magic stuff I have to do to go is it an at sign or is it a string? Because if you put a real string in there, then it uses that as the commit message. Um, then it does the commit. This does the commit. And then the other piece here, this does a Monticello commit of a package. So mm commit project name commits all the dirty packages in that project, in that Monticello project. And then down here, I'm doing a git commit. All right? And so I look up the, uh, somewhere in here, I, yeah, I look up the, uh, the git tool right here. I create a temp file with a commit message because that's what you have to do. I add, I get the status, I do a commit, and then I get the status back. So that's 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 my that's running git from within Smalltalk and from within my commit command for the external project. If I don't want to use git, I, I can I have the option to use different different commands there. Um, let's see what else. Uh, um, um, I've got hello. Oh my goodness, what happened? Oh, there it is. All right. So I'm going to skip skip some more. So I've got diff that does diff for this project. Um, I've got load. This will load, re load, refresh your project. Um, and then um, this x send, I put the x there to be at the end of the list so I didn't have to skip over it. x send at put ref small talk. So let's just look at this son of a gun. Um, because this is the kind of thing that I imagine is the type of tools that I'm talking about when I say developers should be developing, writing their own tools and it should be easy. All right? So what am I doing? I'm getting a shell tool and I'm finding references to the literal small talk. All right? Now the commands all take strings. So inside here he's going to do an as symbol. So I'm actually referencing the small talk symbol. Um, I'm also finding senders of at put. And then I'm doing an intersect of the references between the references and the senders. So now I'm finding all senders of at put that have small talk literal in the method. All right? So this is one of the things that you do when you say senders and then start going through and click around and maybe get a command H and get things highlighted and, you know. So we are small talkers. We write small talk code. You should be able to just write this. If you're, if it comes out back with a list of a thousand guys, write a filter, you know, stop. You know, write a filter. And so this part here got the answer. This is, oh, this is three lines of code to get the answer for what I wanted, not five. And each one of those is five, but no, I mean, don't do the math. Um, now, this is some stuff that I put in here to get an extra feature where I say what the message pattern is, and this is a regular expression, and okay, never mind. Um, I've got this, now I've got this mini tool spec, all right? So we're inside a block, inside a workspace. So these blocks are small talk workspaces. All right, um, but I've got this mini tool spec, and what I have here is I'm doing an edit using on the intersect, and I'm getting the label of these guys because I'm actually getting class definitions back um, or uh, method definitions back. My client list box says, you know, collect mini tool builder object gets this guy here. Can that be cleaner? Yes. Um, and then I collect the labels. So I've got my built my string. All right, I showed you earlier on the slide. This is what builds the string. Um, this block builds the string. And then the implication is I can refresh the, the, the display of that window and get the, the latest version of that block. I've got a menu action block that tells me what menu items do I want for this guy. And in this particular case, oh, I want to do senders on the, the guys. I could, put in, I could put in other things here. Um, and then what happens when I select, when I do the senders menu action? for that guy. And what I do is I do find peer sender and then I say browse methods. All right, and that opens up a browser. Um, and if I don't find the action symbol in that list, then I defer to the mini tool and hope things work right. Um, and then my item select block. What do I want to have happen when you select an item in the list? 
And what I want to have happen here is I want to take the object at index, which gives me the method definition, and tell it item selected. And if you recall, that was what I used, the method that was sent when I click on the items in the, in the selection list. So, and what will happen is, well, whatever's defined to happen when that happens. Um, and that displays the source. So, and then we have a label and then the location. All right, so I'm very close. That slash x. Uh, let me. Dot is not in your path. I don't, I don't know if that means something to you, but. All right, so I do the x senders at put. Here's my list. Um, the regular expression that I was using allowed me to, to do a highlight of small talk and at put. So I can very quickly find these guys. And of course, you know, this, the command, uh, what is it, command G, all right, moves yourself through here. So you can, you know, quickly run, run through this. And so that was the reason I went through the pain and agony of learning the little regular expression to write, because this is awfully convenient when you need it. Um, so I've got, I've got the different guys. Uh, c command shift B, whoops, oh. It doesn't work. Okay, I've got a bug. All right, um, but that's okay. Because um, nothing broke here, just just a piece of code. Um, I do my senders. All right, and I get back a, a list of no senders in that case. Um, I do have one where I've got senders here, and um, so there's you know, you just that tool there fits on a very small screen, and all of the stuff you need is is possible to write. All right, and so you can go crazy and do all kinds of things, build tools, and share them with your friends and neighbors. Now, all right, is this the end? All right, so a workspace takes in some arguments, you write stuff, you build a tool because you want to do some operations, and maybe you've got a big list that you need to, to monkey with, all right? What's the next level up? Do you go to a, a, a class-based tool? And the Monticello tools, if I had time, I would show you, are basically the same kind of thing, except they're class-based. They have a client, client list. They have an item selected, they have a menu action block, and they have a um, whatever the other, the other the fourth thing is. And, but it's class-based, so now you can have state, you can do other things, you know, um, subclass, and, and et cetera. So um, that, that's far, yeah, I think I've covered everything I want to talk, talk about. So, thank you. <laughs> All right, sure. In the Faro itself? So, for example, yep. when, when you saw, and you could compare two candidates ah. uh, with two pen, I was thinking, oh, the, the flow in Faro has a bit, and so I would like to compare the two classes. So, I was wondering how easy or useful would be that your tools could also be applied to the classes running in the host or in, yes. in the Faro. So, um, I would say oof, four months ago, five months ago, I did a prototype where I, I basically got things running in Faro that, you know, basically got the Toad environment running in Faro. So there's some porting that would have to be done. Um, the debugger is the, actually the challenge. And I haven't shown the debugger today, but the, there's a fully functional debugger that, that runs, runs in Toad. Um, but that's the real challenge is getting the debugger to work because, you know, um, in Toad. But, uh, but no, yeah, yeah. That, it, in fact, the, uh, the version of Toad that I had at um, Puerto Madryn was running, I had it running in both Faro and Gemstone. Um, but I rewrote everything since then. So, uh, more questions? One more question? Yes? Mm -hmm. you, you were a recipient of the, of the Windows. Mm -hmm. uh, why uh, did you choose, or why uh, a text edit, uh, editor based in strings? Why not to go for lists or something? Uh, okay. All right. So I simplified what the client looks like. Okay. So what I actually pass back and forth is for li for for lists, I pass a client list element that's an object, and I use Stone to serialize the object. So those classes are shared on both the, the the client and the server. But they're kinds of like if you think of them as widgets, and I actually think of this as like HTML. So you have a list, and there's certain things that you do with HTML, and then you know how to create it on the, on, the, on, the, on the server, ship it to the client, and it displays things correctly. Well, that's what's going on, except we're just using objects instead of HTML. 
All right. And so, yes, I have a, a client list object. It actually, um, I send a first list do over to avoid the, the, the back and forth, but if you refresh, it goes to the server and gets a new list. And I take advantage of the fact that Gemstone has oops, and I use blocks, and I embed blocks into these objects that I pass back and forth. So really, on the client, I'm doing block, value, 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 that then executes the block on the server. And this is leveraging some gemstone capability. But if we were to do it in Faro, it would be direct block-to-block -block execution and no monkey business. So, all right, well, thank you very much. And obviously, I'll be around for questions, more questions.